Hey folks, thanks for checking out another video on G4G here on YouTube. Today, we're going to talk about what I thought BlizzCon 2019 was like. So, as the cops go by on the road and make loud noises, they're coming for me. Apparently, I'm going to get arrested in my own home. No, I'm just kidding. So, before we get into the video, there's something that I want to share with you guys. So we all know, of course, the big Hearthstone debacle with Blitzchung that set off the PR disaster about a month before BlizzCon was due to hit. This was the thing that people were most interested in finding out. How would it go at BlizzCon? And I want to remind people that originally his punishment was a forfeit of all of his winnings and then a year suspension eventually probably due to public pressure from within the united states to counter any of the monetary pressure of supporting somebody who was speaking out against china um it was dropped to he was able to retain his winnings but he still has a six month ban and the casters are still affected i want to share with you a clip from way back in 1993 the circumstances are a really really terrible hit that Dale Hunter put on uh, Dale Hunter of the Capitals put on Pierre Turgeon of the Islanders in the playoffs as retaliation for a game-winning goal. If you've ever seen the movie Young Blood, which starred a young um, Patrick Swayze amongst a couple of other people, uh, Rob Lowe was in it. Rob Lowe was like a young rookie. Or is it Swayze? I forget who it was. It may have been Swayze that it was hit this way. It's the same exact thing. It was actually came out years before this hit. He scores a goal and he suffers a really, really bad hit from a defenseman on the team that he just beat. And his career gets ruined. I, I want to go ahead and show this to you here. Getting expensive. Scott Clark. Here's what he gets Dale Hunter Bill. 21 games, $150,000. So the horrible Hunter has been hunted down and hammered. Hit Watch the clip when it comes up. All ye hockey pucks who hand out the dirty blows, you will pay for your dirty deeds. There was no excuse for what Hunter did. To Watch. Scores. There's Hunter following him. This, and Boom. With a Into the boards, and the Islander bench cleared because that was that was literally the dirtiest hit probably in hockey history. Dale Hunter claimed, "Oh, I didn't hear the bell," um, but he, I mean, every part of this, he was away from the play. He no longer had the puck. His hand was raised in something. It was a completely bullshit excuse for what Dale Hunter did. But as you can see, he only suffered 21 days of suspension and a $150,000 fine. Now, I don't know the price of Blitzchung's winnings, but I do know that 21 days for a hockey player is basically about a month of play. Uh, maybe a month and a week or so. If you think 30, 31 days, 21 days playing in a given month is probably about average so he was only suspended about a month and not in the season this happened because the season was over for the capitals which is why he was so upset the next season when it started the first 21 games of the season he had to sit out and he had that monetary fine so compare an actual physical injury that injury ruined pierre turgeon for the rest of the playoffs if the Islanders were able to go clear through to the Stanley Cup, which I don't remember if they did or did not that year. I don't think they did. They made it somewhere into the playoffs beyond the Capitals, but I don't think they made it to the Stanley Cup. But they were without one of their star players for the entire playoff run of the 92-93 season. That's how bad of a hit. Meanwhile, this poor guy Blitzchung makes his little pro hong kong sentiment on a stream injures nobody says nothing particularly offensive does not swear does not get up there and say just grab him in the pussy like the guy who runs up to the reporters and everything or you know doesn't say anything remotely as offensive as the american united states own fucking president says offends nobody other than just pro hong kong support suspended for a year initially loss of all winnings 
So that's essentially like anything that Dale Hunter would have been getting paid in the playoff run, he would forfeit. And then the fine, like that's how, I mean, that comparison is ridiculous when you compare physical injury 21 days to literally yay Hong Kong, pro Hong Kong, and he's suspended for a year. Ridiculous levels of punishment, but yes, it was knocked down to six months. Still ridiculous. So I retained my ticket for my digital ticket for BlizzCon 2019. I really had an interest in this, not just from what were potential discussion points like Diablo, World of Warcraft, maybe Diablo 2 Remaster was rumored, Overwatch 2. There was a lot of games that I wanted to keep my finger on the pulse of, but from a public relations perspective, I needed to see how this one would go off because I wanted to see where would the protest be? Would people be able to get inside that would cause issues? Would they be right outside of the convention center? Would they be pushed a block away like people were rumored to have been doing and or rumored to like predicted to happen and everything? So I had like this was morbid curiosity for this one. There was legit curiosity and then there was morbid curiosity. So let's jump into what he actually says. This is the very, very beginning moment of when he comes out on stage and kicks off the BlizzCon 2019 opening ceremony. And I will place a link down in the description. So here we go. Ceremony. I want to say a few words. You know, uh, Blizzard had the opportunity to bring the world together in a tough Hearthstone esports moment about a month ago, and we did not. We moved too quickly in our decision making, and then, to make matters worse, we were too slow to talk with all of you. When I think about what I'm most unhappy about, there's really two things. The first one is, we didn't live up to the high standards that we really set for ourselves. And the second is we failed in our purpose. So a couple things here. First, he hasn't named the exact moment and he hasn't named Blitzchung. He also says we didn't live up to our standards without actually saying what is really key and what we know happened is that they didn't live up to their motto. Their motto of like a voice for everybody. The motto that was actually taped over outside of the Blizzard headquarters. So he's speaking in general vagary so far. And by the way, looking at this guy's head and that hair, I just kind of feel immediately this is just not somebody to trust. Hate to say it, that hair is like, that's not trustworthy hair. But okay, let's continue. And for that, I am sorry, and I accept accountability. So what exactly... Body language up to that point, he was nervous. And we'll see if he's nervous after this, but... Non-verbally speaking, he was extremely nervous going up to that point because he was probably afraid that the crowd would not be behind his apology and that the crowd would say, essentially, this is not enough and would boo him. There's a little bit of a tremor to his hand right before the applause. Now, public speaking is a terrible thing in the United States. If you go back to the early to middle 90s, when Jerry Seinfeld was a well-known comedian, he put out a book. And one of the things that I remember from his book, somebody got it from me for Christmas, and I did read it. One of the things that he postulates is that the two biggest fears in the United States are death and public speaking, with public speaking being the first one. And he makes the joke that, you know, you're better off being the one in the coffin than the one giving the eulogy. Speaking from experience, having been on stage for plays, um, 
routinely put in a position of jobs of training people and being in front of large classes, whether verbally, uh, you know, verbally only like video, um, doing, you know, well, not video, just audio for streaming and everything, thing like that, like holding a digital class or a virtual class to actually being in front of people. Uh, at a job anywhere from two people like I had today to ten people um, being on being on stage doing group projects in school in college and everything being a communications major it was very common to often be up in front of a class full of people talking about a project and everything public speaking is tough I don't necessarily know where is the latent thing in your brain that causes you to be scared of it. I mean, you're talking to people. You're you're not JFK. You don't have to worry about getting shot. You're not Martin Luther King. Um, there are primal. Our fears are often primal, coded into our brain from back when we were less smart, less intelligent, and more reactionary to the environment it is an ingrained thing to have a fear of snakes and spiders and everything like that because it's our genetic code tells us these things are problems being scared of a bear being scared of an alligator uh they're you know a shark they're more actual intelligent brain oriented responses where things like spiders and walking through a spider web and snakes and everything that's evolutionary because that's like that spider could kill us that snake could kill us the venom the black widow uh all of that but where is our fear of of public speaking what what's primal about that i i don't know i maybe you would have to ask a psychologist about something like that but public speaking in and of itself is bad enough. Sure, there are performers that get over it. If you look at Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, or John Cena um, being in stadiums full of people and then transitioning to commercials and media like movies and TV shows and everything like that, you, you obviously you, you get to the point where you get it under wraps. But this is a company guy, so there would be a little bit of nerves, but he's done this before. I think the tremor was he was very fearful about the content of his message and he was afraid how the audience would react and um, essentially not go along with what he thinks, what he thinks, quotes, is a positive message. So let's catch back up. So what exactly is our purpose? BlizzCon is demonstrating it even as we speak. We aspire to bring the world together in epic entertainment. And I truly believe in the positive power of video games. So he's done. The apology's done already. And now he's just corporate chilling at this point. When we get it right, we create a common ground where the community comes together to compete, connect, and play irrespective of the things that divide us. As Thank said, God he didn't say regardless. BlizzCon has people from 59 countries all around the world here at the show today. That is amazing. And that is the positive power of video games, to transcend divisions that surround us in so many of our places today. We will do better going forward. But our actions are going to matter more than any of these words. As you walk around this weekend, I hope it's clear how committed we are to everyone's right to express themselves in all kinds of Now places, he's back. All kinds of places. I've actually seen and heard many of you expressing yourself this morning. You use your vacation and your family time to be here in Anaheim with us. And we are so grateful. He's still nervous. His voice is cracked a few our times. Our best moments are here in our shared passion for Blizzard games. So once again, BlizzCon has brought us together. And today you're going to see 
a lot of the hard work of the Blizzard team. So what he did is he started off with the apology by being very vague. Probably so is not to maybe offend any of China watching. Uh, to his, I mean, it really feels like that. And then he loops back around with a middle kind of corporate shill section over there. So the apology was very much a not apology there. It was vague. It didn't really deal with specifics, and it was probably to try and walk a fine line of acknowledging that something happened, getting it out of the way super quick, but then again, potentially not pissing off the people that would have been pissed off had Blitzchung gone unpunished to begin with. It, it's good and bad. It's... Good in the sense that at least they did something and they got it out of the way super quick so that the cloud doesn't taint the rest of BlizzCon. But it's bad in the sense that it wasn't enough. Um, there could have been more and had I been in charge of public... Re well, I mean, had I been in charge of public relations, it never would have gotten to this point. If I had to come in midway like I was in an outside firm that was hired to help them out because they didn't have faith in their own staff to get them through it um, I definitely would have recommended he deal with it first thing like he did and I would have at least started him off very serious and perhaps introduced some brevity towards the end near the apologies uh, conclusion but I would have definitely made sure that things were called out specifically. I would have said stuff like, uh, you know, as you know, earlier in this month, we had an unprecedented event occur within our Hearthstone esports tournament. A player decided to take a victory moment to discuss something political. I would have maybe called it out more specifically, and then I would have gone with what he said. We were very reactionary to the event uh we took steps immediately and extremely harshly we do regret those actions we are not used to being put in this position this is the first time we've had to deal with something like this and i think we overreacted especially very quickly and uh internally staff has met and you know say something to the effect that they have reevaluated their initial reaction and essentially decided to walk a few things back again i still want to point out the casters are still in trouble and blitzchung is still banned for six months for you know way less than what you saw in this video and that was only 21 days um it wasn't enough Supposedly, I think there may be an article out where he's clarifying what he said. I haven't read it yet, but in a vacuum, what he has said here at BlizzCon was not enough and was definitely too vague. But we'll move on to some of the Diablo cinematics here. At first, I thought that was maybe Tyrael. I was like, holy shit, man, Tyrael is really falling on hard times there. It's a, it's a beautiful cinematic. So I'll be skipping a little bit over here because we don't need to watch the full thing. And now we're going to skip to the end so you can see some of the best parts of this. Love this. This is the reason why there were warnings about 
young children and everything for the the blizzcon opening ceremony there were warnings at blizzcon and there were warnings prior to these videos coming out It reminded me a lot of Diablo 2's Dark Wanderer intro cinematics with Marius. Especially that, which was like when Tal Raja was soul stoned up. skip a little bit. So this is basically a curtain of blood that has been drawn between the three pillars and the three people that have been sacrificed on the pillars including him. So before he dies, he realizes that what has come out of this blood curtain portal is Lilith, who I do believe I'm correct in saying is the mother of Diablo. This is your mother. That is that is so wicked. And she's still attached to the blood curtain. Man, I, I mean, I don't care if I saw gameplay, that in and of itself is fucking phenomenal. That's Clive Barker levels of blood and gore right there. That's dark shit. <laughs> I mean, that is dark. That is dark in a half. I mean, that is... If Clive Barker saw that, uh, Clive Barker was going, man... I, I have some students. That is Hellraiser-esque over there. And even if you don't know Clyde Barker movies, but you read his books, that is the mental imagery that Clyde Barker gives you in his books. So now we're going to go ahead and skip past the Diablo stuff. And we'll see. I think they do Overwatch before they do WoW. So for me, the big three were Diablo, Overwatch, and WoW. That's how I felt about it. So Hearthstone, they talked about... Deathwing coming. They talked about Warcraft, Warcraft 3 Reforged and the fact that Warcraft is 25 years old and WoW is 15 years old. They made a vanilla joke, so I thought this was cool. They made a joke about, because of the popularity of WoW Classic, that there is vanilla ice cream available in the concession stands. And they make a joke like, you think you want the vanilla, but you really do. Because they were able to be humble enough to slam their own mentality and make uh, self-deprecating jokes, I really had hope that they would slam themselves for the you all have phones, don't you? comment from last year. I was disappointed that they didn't go there. I thought that would further increase Blizzard's humility in front of the public to, if they're going to make a classic joke, a classic slash vanilla stance joke that they originally said, you think you want classic, you really don't. They may have had a point back then, but the popularity of classic tells them they were wrong. So they're like, okay, we're going to be humble. We're going to take it on the chin and make a joke about it. The fact that they didn't make that joke about Diablo Immortal and the phones was disappointing. By the way, I have a guild mate who was there, and um, she did say that Diablo Immortal was basically basically relegated to one table and the demo area with a few phones and a few laptops. They didn't say anything about Diablo Immortal at BlizzCon that I saw. Um, I was really surprised at that. During the HOTS, 
panel, they did go ahead and have some people walk up and ask questions. And somebody did ask, hey, um, are you guys going to go back to doing pro, you know, pro hots, professional hots? And they did admit it, they didn't dance around it. They admittedly said no, they had no plans at this moment. I appreciated that response because it wasn't a corporate response. It was direct. It's like, no, we don't have time for it. And I appreciated the fact that somebody was able to ask that because that is a big thing for Heroes people that we have the Collegiate Cup, but we don't have anything else that we can consume on Twitter nearly as much. So um, this is the pre-order mount or the and also the pre-patch period for the fifth well not pre-patch this is the 15th anniversary stuff this is where you can get that mount if you do all of the classic raids and then you get that pet and that's all the 15th anniversary stuff so let's go ahead and take a look at some of the warcraft world of warcraft cinematic Ice crown. A monument to our suffering. The veil between life and death. Where a usurper sits on a frozen throne. So if you're not familiar with the story of that, back in Wrath of the Lich King, when Arthas, yes, the actual person who was the inspiration for the name of my cat, uh, when Arthas was defeated, uh, Bolivar sat on the throne and put on the Helm of Dominance to continue to control the Scourge as a form of sacrifice. He says there always must be a Lich King, so he sacrifices himself because he's a wreck at this point. And says, I will be the Lich King so that the uncontrollable form of undead, not Sylvanas' undead, which is the Forsaken, but the actual, like, feral undead do not run rampant across the world. I will be their hive mind and continue to keep them under wraps. So that's, that's the backstory there. But no king rules forever. He was burned by Dragonfire, which is why, despite being on top of Ice Crown, he's all red and fiery instead of blue and icy like Arthas was. Very Empire Strikes Back-esque, the fight between Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker. This is amazing that Solanus is at this power level. I mean, 
I think Bolivar is not as equipped to be the Lich King as Arthas was, and maybe doesn't know his full powers, but Sylvanas has so far got such a massive upper hand here, it's crazy. that's beautiful just him looking this up at her amazing detail and here I was like oh shit she's gonna put it on she's gonna grab the helm of dominance and wait a minute uh oh He looks so sad. He looks so confused and sad. I think the emotion on his face was amazing. And I will set us all free. Okay, so two years ago in 2017, we all got chills during the Banshee Scream. 2017 was still Legion, and we had the Biffa cinematic there, and we had her do the big Banshee Scream over there, and I got amazing chills. It's extremely emotional watching that part. Even what um, Anduin does, although I'm not Alliance, is still really good. And here we are two years later, and Sylvanas goes from this incredible rallying cry for the Horde and this huge banner rally moment to like, what is she doing? So far, neither these cinematics have been good for me, but neither had really hit me on the level of being emotional. Like they didn't, they were good. I appreciated the art and everything, but nothing gave me that chill that the Banshee scream had done. But it wasn't over yet. So they deal with Hearthstone. There's a new expansion coming out. It's going to be heavily dragon based. They're going to have an auto chess type uh, event in there. It should be live maybe next week. It's going to have a beta period where you can play it for free. And then it'll come to the game later. And the spoils of war for Warcraft 3 Reforged. The beta should be going out this week if you had pre-ordered it. And then they're going to expand the betas later on. But I have to go over to Overwatch because this is where things changed on me a little bit. This is where um, finally a cinematic in this BlizzCon was getting to me. So let's play it. So the lead into this is that um, Winston has decided to recall all the Overwatch people and put them as active again. He says the world needs us. Let's go. So there's Torborn and Farah's been referenced. That's Mercy being referenced. And you'll find out on the ship. So Tracer, Winston, Torborn, Soldier, Anna, Reinhardt, Mercy, and a new character. Winston's here. And you'll find out May, ha ha May, potentially Hong Kong May, May is on the mission and you'll see that uh, Tracer is flying. Attention. 
Attention! This is your captain speaking. We are on final approach to Paris. Tracer looks quite cute here. I think she was animated very well and uh she looks quite pretty. And they're landing in Paris, which is actually where one of the newer maps takes place. And that's Null Sector. These robots are called Null Sector. Why is China protesting now? <laughs> Why is Hong Kong protesting China now? Yeah, that would have been funny. I thought that was funny because no, it's not a monkey, it's a gorilla. But close. I thought that was cute. Good work, May. Thanks. Watch your back. Get the civilians to the ship. You got it. It's a Gundam! That's a motherfucking Gundam! So by the way, if you don't recognize it here, because they do deal with it in Overwatch, but not at this scale, what the robot just did there is the what the robot does in Heroes of the Storm when you play the map that is set upon Volskaya Industries. So Volskaya as a map in Overwatch is a big factory that produces robots. But when you play it in Heroes of the Storm and you control the capture point, you get a two-person vehicle that two people um, on the winning team get into the vehicle and that robot that goes around the map until it dies literally has this robot's abilities. So while you don't see it referenced in Overwatch, you actually see its capabilities referenced in Heroes of the Storm. That's why when it did the laser it made the slice down the road and through the drop ship and then exploded along the laser line that's what it does and here's the storm i thought that was a nice nod to continue uh continuity a little bit so things look bad winston's down may's hurt tracer's okay By the way, the voice of Winston is just a very average looking white guy. Like, it's amazing. The voice actor is just this, like, kind of slight white guy. You better be. This, out of the entire opening ceremony, it's this sequence that actually finally got me emotional out of anything they did in the beginning. And it doesn't stop with just Genji. Winston. 
Miracle. They introduced a new character we barely know anything about. And it's still good. And a, huh. The way Mercy comes in like that. I hate Genjis, I hate Genji players, and I still was just like cheering. So that was it out of the Diablo cinematic, out of the Blizzard cinematic. Out of everything else they talked about in the opening ceremony, this sequence in the Overwatch cinematic, which is partly Overwatch 2, is really what they're talking about a lot in this. That's finally the part that got me emotional. And I think why it did is because it very much resembles the end of Infinity War. It's very similar in a lot of ways to the portals opening up on your left. Avengers assemble the sequence of trying to get the infinity stones to somebody with the gauntlet similar to May's uh, cryo pack over there. I don't know that this sequence could have existed if it wasn't for Avengers Infinity War. The sequence towards the end of the movie. Um, you know the huge threat and even when the like it, it resembles it in so many ways like once the heroes are showing up it's still presenting as a threat and still doing uh, damage and they're able to persevere to, through it. And I think it owes a lot to Infinity War. I cannot say for 100% it could exist without that sequence in Infinity War. But I think it's definitely a huge inspiration. And the way people got emotional at Avengers Assemble, including me... Um, I think that same level of emotion comes through for me in this cinematic. And I was wondering if I would have that moment because I felt it wasn't there at all in 2018. But I've been searching for them to give me a really good Banshee scream moment from the Biffa cinematic. And that was it. It was when Gen it all starts when Genji does the deflect. And then Reinhardt comes in with his ultimate and Brigitte is over there with Mace to the face. I did want more. I kind of miss Farah. I miss Soldier. Really, like I really thought you would see Soldier appear in this when the things are being shot from the air. At first I thought it was Farah, but then it was Echo, which we don't have that much detail on yet. But this was finally what did it for me in the opening ceremony after about almost um, a full hour, almost an hour and a half of stuff. Right around, getting close to the two hour mark for this. And I, I was happy for it. I was really excited to see the sequence and it really did tug at the heartstrings on that a little bit. But So we've looked at the major cinematics. We've discussed a lot of what they talked about. Shadowlands is going to be the new World of Warcraft expansion. Uh, you can pre-purchase it now. There are two levels of pre, three levels of pre-purchase, I should say, the standard and two bumped up ones. Um, I will likely, when it comes to Warcraft, I always tend to do the max on that. Um, Diablo 4, no real mention of Immortal, no real mention of a Diablo 2 remaster. Heroes of the Storm, still going strong, not particularly dead. Uh, 
on the show floor they had some arcades of their older stuff like rock and roll racing and three vikings and everything like that they did have some demos i had some people show me pictures of protests going on within blizzcon itself some winnie the poos in the uh in the audience and everything i did have a a reasonable friend and guildmate that was there took a lot of pictures you can get an upgraded package where you have a lounge to watch these things so if you were going to a pal that was too full you essentially had an exterior lounge area out in the concourse that only if you had this kind of pass you could get in they would have snacks and couches and it was like being on the show floor without having to worry about all the traffic and amount of people there so they they definitely had an amazing blizzcon and avoided the tire fires i will say uh the protest did seem to be there there were people handing out free t-shirts in protest there were definitely a lot of winnie the poos at different levels i did catch the so they did something weird with the cosplay they had a cosplay exhibition but then the actual awards were later in the night for what was called community night on the schedule and I didn't see anything that I predicted that I would see where somebody would show up as like a May and then pull out a, a, a free Hong Kong thing or wear the mask, at least not from what I saw. And I hadn't heard of anything penetrating deep into BlizzCon, although there were people um, on the chairs and watching that were in Winnie the Pooh suits. From what I've heard, they weren't turned away or asked to leave. Nobody said anything. Like, there didn't seem to be censorship. People did ask some hard questions when they were allowed to walk up. I don't think anybody went off script and did anything particularly deadly. Uh, USA won the Overwatch Cup, which is amazing if you're an Overwatch fan. We have lost to South Korea every year at blizzcon no matter how good the u.s team thinks it is no matter how good the u.s team was thought of outside of the own team they they played phenomenally they really didn't look like they were in that much danger throughout the entire cup uh the mythic dungeon invitational i believe went to method europe they faced off against method us and method us it, it tended to go the way that they would do well in the beginning of each mythic dungeon and Europe would have one little flub that would set them back about five minutes maybe eight at most but then US would have giant flubs and the US would just rampage right past them it was really weird it happened a few times where EU stumbled in the beginning North America looked good, but then North America had massive wipes, like five-person wipes and then another wipe, and then they just completely lost it. I didn't catch up much with Arena or Hearthstone on this one. I usually watch HOTS and Overwatch. There wasn't HOTS this year, so I caught a lot of the panels, the Diablo panels, the Warcraft panels. I think World of Warcraft is back on track. They've said that they're not going to do the grind nearly as much for the next expansion you'll have these covenants that you ally with that not only give you an ability for your class but they give you a world ability for just being part of that covenant so if you're a druid the fey covenant will give you an ability but then anybody who picks the fey covenant gets a second ability that's shared everybody can be a death knight now because this is such a death oriented expansion and the thought of a mechanome or a fucking Volpera running around as a death knight is hysterical they have said they're bringing back a lot of the class abilities that have gone away they're going to take a lot of the abilities that were for certain specs and give them back to the class um, as a whole it's not like a beastmaster hunter is certainly going to lose the or suddenly lose the ability to be the only one who can tame spirit beasts or crazy beasts they're not losing that but things that maybe were in a class back in vanilla but then got relegated to a spec like a poison poison on rogues is now coming back to all rogues 
totems are coming back to all shaman and more classic totems. So it does seem like Blizzard has listened and learned a lot. They aren't going to do the AP grind again. Alts will have a much more narrow focus. So if you have your main tune who goes... So there's a squish. We're getting squished down to 50. A level 120 person gets changed to 50. And then you level 50 to 60 within the new expansion. When you reach 60 on your main and you've picked a covenant, you've gone through the story, your alts can pick a covenant from day one and begin to progress towards endgame gear and currency from the moment that they start in Shadowland so that you have a streamlined experience where you don't feel bad rushing your alt through because sometimes the alt is needed. Somebody will be like, we need a druid healer for this raid. And you're like, all right, let me roll one. I have a, a feral at 50. Let me level him to 60 and make him resto. You sort of feel bad skipping everything because you're just trying to rush through and get there. Well, they've said you can level any way you want. Like if you want to spam dungeons, then you could spam dungeons. If you want to do the quest, you could do the quest. And you'll be beginning to build towards your endgame 60 character right from the start, which is amazing. Uh, Diablo 4, it's going to be darker, grittier. They said they're returning to their roots of 1 and 2. Um, everything's just going to be dark, bloody. The graphics look amazing. There's going to be dismount abilities. You'll have uh, a hub that you can do all your training and everything in. Then you go out in the wilds, you may encounter friendly people they may stab you in the back in player versus player areas of the map it's going to be huge it's going to be non-linear it's not like act one act two act three and diablo 2 it's more like being dropped in the middle of a world of warcraft zone and allowing you to go to the desert to start or to the frosty region so it's not going to be linear and progressive it's going to be uh open ended the ui looks great kind of squashed down in the lower left corner like it was um the the, the yeah they did a really good job of their games i think they did a shit job of their apology i think they still needed to make reference to uh you think you want it but you don't we know some stuff about Overwatch 2. It's going to share progression with Overwatch 1 in the sense that everything you've done and unlocked for your characters in 1 will move up to 2. So if you have uh, like 50 Tracer skins, they'll come forward. And Overwatch 1 people can play with Overwatch 2 people in the not PvE areas of it. The actual like competitive areas of quick play and everything maps in two will be available for people to play in one so they'll share the same combat space that overwatch one has got now it's just that when you buy the game you'll get access to the pve stuff and sort of like you see here in this sort of paladins level progression of your character you're picking abilities at level 1 10 20 you're modifying your character um they said that basically it's the PvE missions of Overwatch, like Havana, but better. And it has to be better because most people do like that Havana map or the Retribution stuff, the, the Reaper-oriented one from a while ago. Uh, they do it once or twice, and then they're just done with it. it. It almost is like the way you would do some of the seasonal things, like for Halloween or the Olympics and everything like that. You do it a few times, you get your reward, and you bail. And the most recent one with Havana was considered not even that good. So this push mode is a new competitive mode in Overwatch 2. Uh, what was funny about it is one team was surrounding a big robot that was pushing some blocks on the road. And he's like, okay, now progressing this way. And then that team wipes and the other team hangs out by the robot and the robot literally says, okay, going the other way. I fucking cracked up when I saw that. Um, I, I outwardly laughed my ass off when I saw that robot say it. Uh, we don't know all the characters that are available. The cinematics really seem to hint that the roster is limited at first. You'll have a mission map like this, Route 66, Toronto, Paris, 
uh, Volskaya over in Russia. This new character who looks like Zarya to a certain degree with her weapons and everything. Uh, Jeff came out. He seemed unscripted. These seem to be the starter heroes of Overwatch 2. May, Lucio, Mercy, Reinhardt, Tracer. Um, probably also Winston. And then, okay, opening ceremonies were over. So, good opening ceremony overall. I think Blizzard brought it back to a good year. Despite the lukewarm year of 2018 with not an expansion in World of Warcraft. Not Diablo 4, even though there's been rumors that Diablo 4 was ready to talk about in 2018. They chose to do Immortal instead, which was stupid. They chose to do Immortal in the opening ceremony, which was stupid. All Diablo stuff last year was Immortal, which was stupid. I mean, they yes, it was a good BlizzCon. Did they fail in dealing with the Blitzchunk stuff? Absolutely. I cannot defend that. From a public relations perspective, they didn't do enough. As a layperson, as just a fan, even if I didn't have a communications background, I would say still not enough. Barring that, it was a good BlizzCon. I'm happy to have watched it. I felt I got my money's worth with the virtual ticket. Uh, sadly, my girlfriend didn't watch it with me. As enough as I wanted her to. She worked Friday. I didn't. I took the day off for it. But we definitely discussed quite a bit about it. And I would I would love to be able to do a duo video with her at some point. Where we discuss our opinions. Because she's very interested in a lot of what they said about Shadowlands. One thing that was a big key for her. Is she has a lower tolerance for loot issues. Than I do. I can go a while without getting loot in a raid and I don't complain that much because I know it's it's the function of the game. It happens. She is more sensitive to it than I am. If she goes a week or two without getting loot, she tends to get pretty pissy about it. And I know a lot of people in my guild that do. For her, she doesn't do mythics or time walkings per week anymore. And she was more committed to time walking than a mythic. But when you would get that chest at the end of your time walking, if you got something you didn't need, it was a giant disappointment. If you did a bunch of mythics in a week and you got a chest and it wasn't anything you could use and you sharded it or shredded it, it's disappointing. One of the things that they did say is that, hey, if you get your weekly chest, it's not going to be one item that you just trash because it's not good for you. You'll have between five or six things and you pick one of those that's good and if none of them are good there's a fallback currency so i told her about it and she's like that sounds really good i would be excited for that but in our guild discussion on our discord she did say all well and good lots of great talk but it remains to be seen if they stick with it like they did with warlords of draenor if you know anything about warlords there are several things that could have made that expansion way better that were on the drawing board that Blizzard just killed. They didn't put it in the expansion. Shatrath was supposed to be a zone of something. Nope, it stayed in the bubble the whole time. Uh, there, was, there was a missing raid tier. Back in Wrath of the Lich King, was there was supposed to have like Path of the Titans that didn't show up. Or maybe it was back in Cataclysm, I don't remember. Uh, there's a lot of things that occasionally have even been talked about at a BlizzCon that didn't make it. I mean, even in vanilla, there have been continents that they talked about that didn't make it in the game. And Emerald Dream's been in the game since the beginning. Karazhan was maybe going to be a vanilla raid. Um, Outlands was in vanilla's game file. So there's a lot of stuff where in its history... Blizzard has had it available physically or said it verbally at a convention or a game show and said, yeah, we're going to have Lamborghinis with V10 engines and 7,000 horsepower, but get 30 miles to the gallon and you'll be at your destination in three seconds. And then the expansion drops and everybody's like, where's the sports car that I was promised? I got a hoopty with a trailer hitch and a broken taillight. So she did point that out, which was a little bit more Debbie Downer than me. 
but that is valid. That's a valid concern, and people are like, yeah, it remains to be seen. So this pretty much wraps it up for my impression of 2019. Overall, I think it was great. Diablo 4, Overwatch 2, and Warcraft, World of Warcraft Shadowlands are the high points. My most emotional cinematic was definitely the Overwatch 2 one because of its resemblances to Infinity Wars. Uh, very excited for Shadowlands. Excited to get into a beta for it. Excited that at my current job there is a chance that I become a full-time telecommuter for it and I would love to be back home again double work and play at the same time that's what i did for 2009 to 2012 every day full time and then from 2007 to 2009 i had several days per week where i was able to do it i loved that flexibility it's a ton of fun it's also when i happen to love wow the most nowadays it's a little more jobby than fun but that's that's the fault of the expansion and the fact that I'm a guild leader. I have certain pressures on me that a lot of other people don't. But I'm very exci- I'm very excited for everything that they've talked about at this BlizzCon. I'm not disappointed. I am disappointed in the public relations controversy. So thanks for watching the video, guys. I know it was long. A lot of stuff we needed to talk about over here. Let me know what you think below. I mean, if you're a Blizzard fan, what did you think of all of this stuff? Were you able to catch any BlizzCon stuff? And, like, what are you looking forward to? So, peace out, everybody. Thanks for watching the video.